Welcome, everyone, to another Voices with Raveki. I'm very excited to be here with my friend, Bishop Maximus. Uh, we've had two amazing conversations. Uh, well, they've been more than conversations. Uh, I think at times they get into uh, uh, dialogical um, uh, uh, flow. Um, and uh, we're going to pick up this third conversation on uh, ritual and theosis. Um, but the bishop also uh, recommended uh, talking about my project in After Socrates, and I'll use this as a, a, a venue to shamelessly plug for my series After Socrates, um, where I'm trying to reverse engineer a, a Neoplatonic way of life, especially practices around dialectic into dialogos. And I'm going to propose to you, Bishop, that we uh, we start with that third thing, the reverse engineering Neoplatonism. And um, I know you have thoughts on it, and I, I, I want to give you space and time to um, give me your reflections and your 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 responses to that project of trying to reverse engineer uh, a Neoplatonic way of life. Well, thank you so much, John, for having me me on again. Uh, it's uh, always a, a huge pleasure to to speak me with too. you. Yeah, and um, you know we've had great conversations and I believe that this conversation is going to be uh, wonderful as well. So um, thank you very much for, for having me on and I will try to plunge into the topic that uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we, we proposed. So uh, I've been listening avidly to your new series um, after Socrates. Mm, thank and you. you have in uh, clearly a project in that series of reverse engineering Neoplatonism. I think you state that explicitly. Yes, I do. Uh, right. So, and it's a, a project that interests me because there was a sense in which I tried to do the same thing right. or something similar. Right. Um, although, of course, I reached, ultimately reached somewhat different conclusions from you. Yes. Um, which, by the way, do not necessarily preclude everything that you're saying mm -hmm. uh, by any means. So I, I think I think in order for me to explain where I'm coming from on, on this question, uh, I, I'm going to have to go back in time a little bit and uh, explain a little bit uh, or something about my personal life, um, which um, is... Um, I don't know if it's a little bit uh, embarrassing, but it's you know it's just human existence has its ups and downs, and uh, we have to recognize the fact that this is this is our human life. So I'll hold uh, everything you say like in respect and um, in the trust that we placed in each other. I I know you do. I know you do, John. Um, so I became a monk at a young age. And I really tried to live the monastic life as best as I could, according to the traditions of the Orthodox Church, according to the teachings of the Orthodox Fathers, particularly those fathers who, who um, uh, were writing specifically for monks and, and how to lead the monastic life. Uh, even though in the Orthodox Church, we believe that those writings are ultimately applicable to everyone. Uh, and um, according to the, the guidance of my spiritual father, uh, the abbot of the monastery, uh, this is called Holy Ascension Monastery. It was in New York State, where I lived for about, I don't know, about 17 years I lived there. Um, now, in the Orthodox Church, we have the spiritual father in in uh, particularly in a monastic context we have a term that we use in english would be elder mm. uh in greek it's yerondas yeron in ancient greek yerondas in modern greek and in in russian it's called stadis um now there's actually a literary representation of a uh, russian stadis in dostoevsky um in the brothers karamazov when they go to meet the the elder, the started Zosimas. If you remember that that episode, mm -hmm. it's an attempt to to represent um, what an elder is in in the Orthodox Church. Uh, 
for reference to those who um, have never heard of this uh, phenomenon in, in the Orthodox Church, you could think of it uh, a little bit like a guru in right, right. Uh, Hinduism. Now, obviously, it's not, the, it's not the same thing. I don't want to make an identity claim at all. Um, and maybe some Orthodox will criticize me even for mentioning that idea. Or perhaps uh, um, like a Sifu uh, within the martial art tradition, the, the master teacher leader uh, that you sort of entrust yourself to. Uh, right. Um, even, even though the word guru in, in Sanskrit just means teacher. Yeah. Uh, but, um, so and anyways, uh, in Orthodox monasticism, every monk is supposed to have his elder be in obedience to, to his elder and receive spiritual guidance from, from his elder, which is uh, passed down from one person to another. There is an unbroken succession in the in Orthodox monasticism, and um, to the best of my ability, I was trying to to live the the Orthodox monastic life according to the the teachings of the fathers, the institutions of Orthodox monasticism, the guidance of my my elder, my spiritual father, and so forth. And it was and and I was trying very hard. I mean, I was really putting my heart into it, and. It was. It worked. I was making spiritual progress, genuine spiritual progress, and uh, everything that I was experiencing, both within and without, was completely in accordance with everything that I was reading in the writings of the Holy Fathers, and I felt very, very comfortable. Uh, and very, let's say, even optimistic about my my spiritual life in that, let's say, in that phase of my mm. my my monasticism. What happened was, um, I ran into a wall. Mm. Um, I ran into a kind of uh, dead end spiritually, where I found that I just that doing the things that I was doing, I couldn't advance spiritually anymore. And it wasn't just that I wasn't forcing myself enough. Uh, it was that uh, there was actually some sort of psychological block. Right. Um, I, I, I use psychological for lack of a better term. Sure, um, sure. You know, you can call it a spiritual block, call it whatever you want. It was something, something in my mind and my soul um, that um, if I had pushed myself harder in that way uh not only would i have not made progress i actually would have damaged myself right uh, right maybe that, that strong of, intuition like yeah that. maybe to the point of going crazy I right mean, I, right I, I right really feel it. um so it was it was a big issue for me because this was my life right so yeah. what, what am i gonna do with my life if i, right, if I don't right. make any any kind of progress and so i was i was in this kind of crisis um you know which did not manifest itself too much externally you know ex externally i was doing everything that uh, you know i continued to perform the external aspects of the monastic life and the way that they are normally done um but internally there was there was a kind of a kind of a crisis uh, which lasted for some years it was not something that just came and went it was um it it, it was a serious re-examination of what's what's going on here um and you know is the problem with me is the problem with uh, uh i'll admit that the thought actually came to me is the problem with the teachings of the fathers are they sure. are they missing out on something um you know, it was a real, it, it was a, a real problem, and and um, you know, it would be dishonest if I didn't uh, mention the various thoughts that went through my mind, which uh, you know, I don't think they they would sound unreasonable to to anyone who would you know be going through something like this. Uh, I I know that many other people have gone through their own spiritual crises and have. Uh, obviously not the same thing, but you know, 
all these kind of thoughts end up sure, sure. generating in my head. So, um, so I was left with with the question: Well, what do I do? I can either just accept that this is the way things are and basically resign myself to stagnation. Um, that that was not a very appealing option to me. Um, stagnation is something that I abhor. Um, yeah. And I guess you feel that way too. Yes, very deeply, very deeply. Yeah. Um, so um, the only other option that I could see was, well, I need to find another way forward. If what I'm doing is not working, then, then, and, and if my beliefs and if orthodoxy and orthodox monasticism are fundamentally true, which I believe and believed, then there has to be another way forward. So, so then I put myself to look for what that other way forward was. Um, and now, there was uh, another factor that was influencing the way that this uh, played out for me, which was that around the same time, or maybe a, a little bit earlier, maybe a year or so earlier, I had begun to study philosophy in a serious way, right. uh, particularly ancient Greek philosophy. Uh, not exclusively, I mean, I read widely, but um, particularly ancient Greek philosophy. And the reason for that was that uh, I was reading the Fathers of the Church, and I, I, I read practically everything that was available in in English. And I was starting to read what was uh, what had not been translated into English, what was still in in Greek. And um, I realized that the in order to really understand the the Fathers of the Church, I had to have some sort of basic knowledge of ancient Greek philosophy. Of course. Because that was the thought world that they yeah, were living. In. Yes, yes. You know, all of the all of the fathers of the church, uh, those who you know, in the Orthodox Church, we use the word father to um, very broadly. Uh, basically, we could say in any saint of the church who leaves behind writings and instruction, uh, regardless of their let's say philosophical or intellectual or theological level. But for the let's say for the major fathers of the of the church who were talking about theological uh, issues on a deeper level, there was a heavy philosophical element there that couldn't be avoided. And for me to understand them, I had to study ancient Greek philosophy because, of course, that was the environment that they came from. You know, by so I set myself to basically to duplicate the ancient Greek. Uh, curriculum, educational curriculum. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and, um, you know, basically so that I could build up in my head the same thought world right. that right. all of the fathers of the church or most of the fathers of the church had. So that, in other words, so that I could understand them on their own terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, by, by late antiquity, the educational curriculum had basically been standardized and uh it included things like you know you would start out reading the the iliad and the odyssey you would read the a selection of the playwrights uh you would read uh, some of the the orators demosthenes uh you would read the uh, some instructional manuals on on oratory because rhetoric was in in many ways the framework in which education was presented in late antiquity uh so for hermogenes for example and his uh progymnasmata which are the the rhetorical exercises that help prepare you to speak uh in a rhetorical manner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, by rhetoric you know we think of rhetoric in modern and and our modern world is, you know, just being kind of florid, yes. uh, often excessive language. In in ancient times, rhetoric was virtually indistinguishable from just clear thought and composition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, and then of course the philosophers, uh, Aristotle, first of all, his his logical works and um, his uh, what we could call 
his physics and some of his scientific works. These were a basic part of the, the curriculum for everyone. Um, and then on a higher level, a more advanced level, there would be the study of Plato. Right. So, um, you know, I went, I went through, I can't say I read every single piece of <laughs> ancient Greek literature, but, you know, I read a lot and uh, particular, with particular uh, emphasis on the philosophers. And, um, well, I was presented with or confronted with a different way of looking at what we could call the spiritual life mm -hmm. or the structure of reality, one which was extremely powerful and which made many of the same claims that we have in the orthodox church or in christianity you know this idea of the union yep. with the one or with god however you want to call it this idea of the you know something like realism um however you want to conceive the question of the forms or anything like this um the contemplation of reality the the purification of the soul so many ideas were uh, similar to parallel with what existed in the, in the Orthodox Church, and of course there is a lot of mutual borrowing, tremendous amount of mutual borrowing. Yes, yes. Um, that I was um, well, in in a way, it was a new world that was being opened up to me. In another way, it was extremely familiar because uh, much of it I was already doing. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, since I was in this kind of spiritual dead end, and at the same time, I was discovering a similar but sufficiently distinct right. spiritual path, met, let's call it method to union with, with God, um, obviously it was a temptation for me. Right, right. You right. know, it was it was a temptation. The Neoplatonism and its and its uh, somewhat intellectual means of ascent towards God was was a temptation to me. Right, right. And um, it was something that I thought about very very hard because, of course, when you when you're looking for an answer and and a possible answer is presented to you yeah. you know you're not you're not going to throw the opportunity away no no so uh well so so what happened um basically i i thought about it very 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 hard and you know in the context of my own person and my own soul this idea of of basically a semi intellect, um, which was more or less how I was how I was understanding the the Platonic method of um, uh, dialectic and and the contemplation of the forms. Now I know I know you have a your own um, version of that. Sure, which, sure, but, that, but keep going. It's good. This is know, good. This we, is really we, good. We, um, maybe addresses some some of the issues yeah. that I was confronting. Yeah. Um, but anyways, that that's that's where I that's where I was and how I was thinking. So um, but I realized uh, being honest with myself that if I pursued that path, and I wasn't talking about abandoning the Orthodox Church or abandoning monasticism or anything sure, else, sure. it would all be within the context of what I was already doing. Um, just kind of a reorientation of of my my methods um, and my mind frame, the I realized that if I went down that route, I there would be no way that I could avoid getting it mixed up with a lot of egotism. Yeah. Um, ultimately, a form of intellectual pride yes. and some sort of elitism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which put in put in its most simple form. It's like I'm smarter than you, therefore I'm better than you. Yes. Yes. Um, and um, you know that that temptation exists within 
Neoplatonism. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm I'm sure you've seen it. I'm sure you recognize it or identify. Uh, yes, I recognize it. I recognize it in myself. I I hope. Um, um, and I, I, I hope that recognition isn't just some subterfuge of the very thing we're talking about, I, yeah. right? I, I, I hope, I, I, I profoundly hope that it's, uh, it, that it's authentic and genuine, the recognition. Um, so I totally acknowledge that point. Um, and we'll take it up in the discussion, but please continue your narrative right now. Right. So... Um... I, I understood that if I wanted to to lead a a pure spiritual life that wasn't on some fundamental level mixed up with my own pride, um, my own egotism, my own passions, that that was not going to work. That path was not going to work for me. Um, that was one reason why I didn't do it. There is a second reason, uh, which is that at the core, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in the Gospels. I, I, I believe in, in uh, all of the, the doctrines of the Orthodox Church. And, and uh, you know, when you, when you read the Gospels, and then if you compare it to, let's say, Platonic um, dialectic, it's clear there's a, at the very least, there's a difference in spirit mm -hmm. at the very least. Um, now that doesn't mean that there's not a way to reconcile the two uh, on, on some level. And, and in fact, I, I believe that Christianity did reconcile them on, on, on some level, but, but if we were going to take, let's say the pure unadulterated version of, of Neo, Neoplatonism, um, it was, it was a spirit that was, alien enough to let's say the pure mes message of the gospels that i i just didn't feel like i could you honestly be at home there you wouldn't be at home in that other right, spirit. honestly yeah. pursue it and still be more a christian than a, than a neoplatonist right 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 um and you know my my soul wouldn't allow me to to do that okay um, but but I was still confronted with the, with the question of wow this is a this is powerful yeah, yeah um yeah. and it's not you know it's not something to be dismissed so um so there was a question of what to do with it now if we go on to that was the let's say what, what you would call the dialectical method we can call it the dialectical method I don't have a problem with that um that's one aspect of neoplatonic spirituality yeah, yeah. it's not the totality yeah, there is. Yeah other parts to it as you acknowledge um the and i think are trying to integrate um it, there's also spiritual practices uh practical things which are uh, many of which are borrowed from stoicism yes, yes um which really is i think um criminally underrated in modern scholarship or at least up until very recently Although it's a big deal now in the popular world, Stoicism is going through this uh, huge revival. Um, I, I think of Neoplatonism as the uh, the integrating the integration and, and not just the adding together, but the integrating gestalt of sort of uh, Platonic anagogic spirituality, uh, Aristotelian psychology and science, um, and, and, and Stoic. Uh, ethics and existential practices and and so that's uh, um yeah well, that's, I, I, that's exactly the way that i view it yes good 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 please um, continue then yeah right so um you know so so there were all these stoic practices that were integrated into into neoplatonism yeah um and um many of them were adopted into the orthodox church with uh as uh, particularly as part of monastic practice mm -hmm. so so things for example like the the remembrance of death um there is the stoic practice of the the contemplation of future evils in order to prepare one's soul pre-meditatio yeah 
the premeditatio, primer, um, there was in particular very perhaps the most important element um, in Stoicism, Stoic practice is uh, the distinguishing between those things which are within our power and those things which are without outside of our power and mm -hmm. uh, acquiring equanimity of, of soul or apathia, the word that they actually use, uh, which is not apathy. Yes, yes, um, I say that very clearly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, in Greek, taifimin, ketau, kefimin, the things that are dependent on us, the things that are not dependent on us. And, and this was completely 100% integrated into Orthodox monasticism. I, I just want to say that um, I did not find them present um even in a reduced form in the protestantism that i was brought up in and i'm not sure perhaps there's versions of this in in catholic monastic practice so i don't i won't speak to that uh but um i was like i first in, when i encountered them in stoicism they were completely novel to me mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so um i just want to point that out uh that because there, there's probably a lot of people listening that um are from other christian denominations or none and they might say what are you talking about i don't like it but I, I that's interesting how much that is like uh, is there uh, are there things like also the view from above practice that was taken up in stoicism and also taken into neoplatonism i've done some work on on that um sure and uh in in fairness uh practically all of this is in roman catholicism as well okay Okay. Um, now, I, I mean, the, the, the problem in Roman Catholicism is not, not that it doesn't exist, it most certainly exists, it's just that the, the mainstream presentation of Roman Catholicism is so watered down that, that many people don't see it. They have, to dig, see. They have to dig a little bit. I see. Um, which is, by the way, um, this is a tangent, but I'll mention it anyways, which, which is, by the way, one, one of several reasons why people who convert to Roman Catholicism usually convert to traditionalist forms of it. Um, yes. yes. However you want to define yeah. traditionalist, you know, very few people um, convert to the more, I don't know, popular. Modern. Like, I think modern is exactly the right adjective. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then in, in Protestantism, well, of course, since Protestantism, Protestantism explicitly rejects tradition, um, that's a really good way to cut yourself off from any of these kind of practices. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that if you have this idea of salvation by faith alone, well, then why do you need all this extra stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, that's not totally fair to, to Protestants because I know that Protestants make a distinction between justification and sanctification. Yeah. Um, and um, there is certainly a, a, a mechanism within Protestantism whereby they could, could in theory, reintegrate that. Yeah, I've had a, a, a very good, interesting conversation with Jordan Cooper around that. Um, but let's go back. To okay, your, going back, go back to the yeah. to the main theme. All right. So, so basically, you had you had within Neoplatonism a number of practices. Um, <clears throat> some of them many of them were already present in orthodoxy and particularly in orthodox monasticism yeah so well i didn't have to change anything there because i was already doing it yeah right, right. all of these had already been internalized very much into my spiritual life um and still still are now there is another set of of practices um which were not accepted by the church historically. And these were primarily the practices that were connected explicitly with paganism. Yeah. So most most obviously the worship of idols. Yes. Um, and by extension, the the Neoplatonic attempt to just find a philosophical justification for this, which ended up being theurgy. Yes. Yes. So um uh, you know, as I mentioned on a previous and our previous conversation, um, it's very difficult for me, and historically it was sure, difficult sure. for for the church 
to see theurgy as anything more than simply a, a, a kind of refined intellectual uh, version magic. of magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and now I, I know you, you have you have some thoughts on that, which may be leading in a slightly different direction. Um, and um, I'm open to to hearing your your thoughts on those. But uh, at least for myself, what I saw was that, of course, as a Christian, I wasn't going to worship idols. No, um, nor nor was I nor was I going to engage in any sort of um, any sort of pagan rituals where I'm trying to animate statues or do do any of these practices which were connected with with uh, theurgy. Mm -hmm. Rather, I saw that the elements of theurgy which were actually true and actually valid, and of course there there were some present um were already present in in orthodoxy in uh the the liturgy yes in the yeah. services yeah. that we that we yeah. perform yes uh so and from my point of view in in a much better way so i um i thought to myself well i'm not going to go down that route and i have a better version of it version of it uh yeah anyways so you know there's no no question there now the third element which we haven't discussed which we can get into is um well i don't know if it's the third element anyways there's there is the question of dialectic which you which you yeah, think yeah. you want to bring up but any anyways the long and the short of it is that this was my spiritual experience. This was my my confrontation with Neoplatonism. Um, I I learned a tremendous amount from it, absolutely tremendous. Um, I ended up rejecting the let's say the more pure form of Neoplatonism, but um, I I did come to a to a I don't want to say a compromise solution. I the 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 power, the truth, the nobility, the beauty of Neoplatonism forced me to take it seriously, mm -hmm. very seriously. Along with the fact that you know I was at a dead end with yeah. with what I was doing before, and so what that did was since I was um, committed to being orthodox and that meant uh working within the framework of orthodox tradition and the fathers of the church what that what that motivated me to do was to then reread some of the fathers of the church in order to see if there was something that i was missing ah, ah. something that i was missing that addressed some of the same issues or approaches that existed in neoplatonic dialectic right um and where i found that was primarily in saint maximus mm -hmm. yes um and saint maximus talks a lot uh, about contemplation theoria yeah very much very mm -hmm. much i'm reading maximus right now Right now, of course, he's not the only father. Um, no. There are lots, of, lots of fathers of the church that, that talk about this, but um, you know, he was the one who, who most, um, most appealed to me, and who maybe who spoke the most extensively about it. And so, so what the the conclusion that I reached on maybe on an intellectual, but also on a on a personal, practical, spiritual level was was that the, the way forward for me spiritually was, um, while not abandoning any of the practices that I was doing, um, which in fact still form the, you know, the most basic layer of my, my spiritual life, my monastic life, um, in which under, under no circumstances would I dismiss or uh, deprecate or uh, diminish 
um, in order for me to live a more full spiritual life and to actually make some real progress spiritually when I had been stalled out, um, I had to take up a new practice. Let's call it that, Please. which was which was contemplation. Right. right. Contemplation in the maximum sense of the word. Yes. Um, which is not the same as the Neoplatonic version, um, but which nevertheless does share certain commonalities and mm -hmm. um uh, which uh, I would I would argue um, how convincingly I don't I don't know but um, which I uh, at least which I conceive of as as being um, another element in the transfiguration of Neoplatonism. Excellent. Excellent. So that's where I am right now, uh, oh, and uh, that's I'm great. I'm okay. really happy I'm really happy with it. I'm really happy it it um, you know and it both provides a way for me to have a fruitful, meaningful um, spiritual life. And uh, it certainly provides a bridge for me to speak with, you know, with you and with many other yeah. people. Well, I have a bunch to say. That was wonderful and beautiful. And I, I'm honored to be able to just bear witness to this. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, one thing is, I, I might put it to you that you pick, you've taken up another practice, and because I properly regard it as a practice, which is the teaching of philosophy. Um, and I have, and I view, I view it as part of the same. Yeah, the same right. thing. Good, good. And, yeah. and for that, for that matter, I view our conversations as part of the same. Yes, thing. great, excellent. Um, <clears throat> so you you alluded to a question. I'm going to raise it more explicitly, and uh, thank you for that. Um, as you as, as you said, I'm trying to reverse engineer, and I I, I think of sort of the, uh, this triangle of things I'm trying to reverse engineer when I'm reverse engineering um, Neoplatonism. One, which we've just ended on, is you know the meditative contemplative pole. Um, I use those terms slightly differently from each other, as you know, because they they point in sort of different aspects of mindfulness reflective practices. Um, yes. Uh, like you, I reject most of what you would call the magic uh, in uh, theurgia. I'm not trying to bring back theurgia proper or anything like that. I'm not interested in uh, worshiping idols or, or anything like that. But I do want to pick up on um, the use of the imaginal within ritual to enhance our ability to detect uh, otherwise undetected subtle patterns, psycho- uh, somatic, uh, psychosocial, psychoontological patterns. Uh, I feel that very present, for example, when I, in Tai Chi Chuan practice, doing Tai Chi. Um, and I think um, I think Strzok's book on divination and human nature, the ancients, uh, they, they treat divination very differently. And it, it, the name is, of course, kind of important too. They treat it differently. Um, they don't write treatises about magic or sorcery, but they care about this ability. And Strzok makes, I think, the very good point that the term we would use for what they're talking about is intuition. And they're trying to really understand this ability we have for insight, intuition. Um, I think it, uh, one way of thinking of it is the a way of imaginally exercising uh, the capacity for noose, that capacity. Um, and... Um, so I'm interested, I, I'll, the, I'll, I'll, I'll make a hybrid word for this poll, the ritual liturgical poll. Um, and, and then I'm interested in this third that properly depends on them, which uh, I've been calling dialectic into dialogos, where dialectic is a practice and dialogos is a process that you can only participate in. You can't do dialogos. If you're trying to do dialogos, you're, you've missed it. It's like doing love. You have to participate in it, uh, but it's not something you can make happen. You can't be a, the, the causal agent. Uh, dialectic helps you cultivate a receptivity uh, to getting into dialogos. And I think that dialogos is not being reducible to dialogue precisely because it has the, it seriously and deeply has these ritual liturgical aspects to it and these uh contemplative meditative aspects to it 
and it's seriously trying to work with something like the collective intelligence of distributed cognition. And so for me, um, I hold that, and I, I, do the, I do the triangle deliberately. That for me, and this is Plotinus, he holds dialectic as being you know, the, the greatest practice. And Socrates you know, repeatedly says to, to engage in dialectic, right? Or dialo into dialogos is the best way that a human being can live. No, I know, I know you don't agree with that, but I, I, I'm just saying why I justify putting it at the top of the pyramid. And so my question that I want to raise to you, and I don't know, I'm ignorant about orthodoxy, so I'm just going to state the ignorance. Um, I've, I don't see these practices. I don't see them like, so people are something like in a platonic dialogue. Um, and they're getting into dialogos. And as Socrates says, he's following the logos like you follow the wind. And uh, there's some resonance there with Jesus about comparing the, right, um, uh, the, 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 where does the spirit flow from and blow from, right, the, like the wind. Um, and I don't see those practices, those dialogical practices um, in the Protestantism that I'm familiar with or that I've examined. Um, I'm not clear... I don't see them in Roman Catholic churches. Perhaps they exist in Roman Catholic monasteries, so I'm open to hearing that. But my question is, for me, <laughs> this is the core thing, because uh, this is where uh, we can encounter something like, and I, I'm saying this with respect, and I hope you take it that way, something like, analogous, so not exactly like your encounter with the elder or exactly the Vedantist encounter with the guru or the Taoist encounter with the Sifu, but at least in that family where the group actually acts like Socrates uh, to the individual and provides um, in the process and the practice something that can overcome egocentrism and um, significantly challenge uh, a kind of intellectual pride um, I'm not saying it's a panacea, and I'm not saying it's an algorithm for resisting those, but um, I think these practices like philosophical contemplation, philosophical fellowship around a philosophical text, Lexio Divina, and dialectic into dialogos. I don't see, I know Lexio is in the, the Catholic tradition, in the yeah, monastic. It's the same thing in the Orthodox Church. Right, right, right. So I'm asking, is there anything like that in orthodoxy and, and first of all i want to make sure that that's a, a fair question to ask so it's a very fair question it's an it's an excellent question um let me answer your first question first about yeah. ritual and the imaginal yes um so you've been talking a lot about the imaginal which i guess you get from corban corban and some other things yeah yeah hillman and others yes and uh, uh and raf yes those are okay. the three biggest influences on me about the imaginal. All right. And, um, you know, I, th I think I understand what you're referring to when, when you talk about it. Uh, of course, the imaginal is not part of common parlance. Uh, you know, people talk about the, the imagination. Yes. Um, yes. And, or fantasy. Um you know, but the but what you're referring to is something quite quite different. Yes, very much. Um, and um, and obviously, uh, I think once I understood what you were referring to, it seemed to be obviously true within at least within its own parameters. Um, you know, you give the example of the the Tai Chi, um, and you know, obviously it works. Yes. So, oh, all right. Now, if we apply that to ritual um so first of all let's let's try to define ritual at least in orthodox terms um uh, for the orthodox a ritual is a kind of symbol yes um but specifically it is an enacted symbol it is or you could say a performed symbol yes uh and that's that's actually indicated in the Greek word for ritual, which is teleti, um, or the, the Neoplatonists sometimes use the word uh, telestiki. Um, but it comes from the word uh, telo, which means to finish, 
to to complete or you know ah. just something or to perform right to um you know and there's words in greek that are related to it, like ektelo you know to um uh to uh execute um a a task uh so so the the idea in greek of of ritual is even by the word itself which is obscured in in english um connected to the idea of a physical practice yeah it has to yeah. be an yeah right um now i know you talk a, a lot about how we need in our ecology of practices we need a physical practice as yes um you know as included in that and of course in in christianity the the way that we have this or at least part of the way that we have this is through ritual and um so if we think of it as enacted symbolism we of, of course a symbol is understood in the orthodox church as um if you'll allow me uh, the explanation um you know we 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 view we have we view concrete individual particulars within the world we abstract them in order to come up with a general idea um and we can do that within a religious context so we can think of obviously the good the beautiful the true these are abstractions from specific examples of yes. you know some beautiful thing or some true statement or whatever um but the problem is that human beings uh we think more easily in concrete terms than we do in abstract terms uh to think abstractly requires a certain mental effort um and it's uh it's well it's difficult for for a lot of people and it's difficult for everybody over you know a sustained period of time so so what a symbol does is it re-represents to us an abstraction in a concrete way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but in a way which contains within itself the totality of the abstraction and thus all of its its particular examples uh so you know we have uh we have all sorts of uh rituals in in the orthodox church uh liturgically this would be the primary primary mm. mode and uh of course we have um ritual statements ritual gestures uh we have you know movements processions uh we have the chanting um all of which you know goes according to a certain order we have the 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 structure of the music itself which is um of course which is according to a certain set of rules we, you know we don't just use any music uh in in church um the music itself is symbolic and you know as saint athanasius the great says uh, that music brings the soul into harmony with itself Mm -hmm. And you know, he didn't come up with that idea. <laughs> that was previously stated <laughs> Pythagoras. By, <laughs> by Pythagoras. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and and what what symbolism in the especially in the context of the church allows us to do is it makes these abstract ideas immediately accessible to us in in a way that everybody can can experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and ultimately what that does is you know connecting again to, to your work um although obviously it was thought of before you know a few thousand couple thousand years before you were around <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah of course <laughs> um, it, you know is is that in it allows us to experience the what could what could be understood as a proposition it allows us to under to experience it uh in a perspectival way mm. uh, well first in a procedural way i mean chanting yeah. is a procedure for example um 
then in a perspectival way, because you know, we we if we enter an Orthodox church, we see all the icons there, it immediately puts us in 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 the mood to think about you know all of these, you know, think about God, the life of Jesus, the, the saints. And then in a participatory way, yes. um, you know, we we are very much participating in the liturgy. Uh, obviously, if you're um, uh, if you're if you're listening to to the chanting, for example, you're uh, with attention. You are uh, participating in it, and if you're actually doing the chanting, then then you're um, participating in an even more obvious manner. So. So basically, the the symbolism allows us to um, to experience on a practical level, on the on all all of the levels of knowledge that you that you talk about, uh, which I think are great categories, by the way, and which um, I frequently refer to. Um, so thank you for for your thank work you there. Yeah. Um, you know, it allows us to to experience those things, which otherwise would be difficult to to access. So it's basically, and and you know, all all of the symbols of the church converge. We're talking about when we talk about abstractions. You know, we're talking about the things which um, are ultimately the structure of reality. And so when we have when we have symbols which are representing elements of the structure of reality. Um, and of course, we have many different symbols. They all mutually reinforce one another so that we can participate in the entire structure of reality by means of these symbols. All right. So could I just reply to that point before you move to the sure, second? Sure, sure. I, 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 do, you, do you agree with that, by the way? I do, I do. I, 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 but I, I want to extend it and see if you agree with the extent. First of all, that joining of the intelligible uh, to the sensual, if I can put it that way, because I want to use Corbin's terms, that's, that is the defining feature of the imaginal. That's, it's the symbol mm -hmm. on it. It actually is what... Um, brings the two together you were calling it the abstract and the concrete but that maps on exactly to what he's he's talking about um, and that, by the way the fathers do use that that terminology you just said the the intelligible and the, the sense and sensual the yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And, and 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 yes i think the imaginal is like you said it's a way of engaging the non-propositional properly and then I pick up on the work of uh, Jennings and Schilbrecht and others that what makes a imaginal ritual is that it transfers that non-propositional knowing to non-ritualized contexts and informs um, those non-ritualized contexts such that people can more conform to a good life. Um, yes. So, yes. Right. And so, and that that's a, so I, I want to extend that horizontal dimension that I talk about I think that's properly and you're saying yes so I think you agree with that and then the other is it, it uh, I want to I want to talk about how it not only reaches up it reaches down uh, because the, the point is everybody and you did say this but every all of the propositional is always deeply reliant on and embedded in the non-propositional you and I are both gesturing when we're trying to talk we're nodding we're playing with intonation we're flipping around perspectives with metaphor we're doing all of this. And it's to say that, right, it's not only so much that the symbol reaches up, and I, I'm, I'm going to, and I hope you'll take this in the right way, but it reaches down, it reaches into the depths of our embodiment and our, 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 our like, of, of our cognition. So it's deep calling to deep, if I can put it yes. that way. Um, no, that's so a that, beautiful scriptural reference, by the way. Yes, that's one of my favorite passages from the Psalms. Um, and so I, uh, uh, that's, uh, I, I just, I'm just, I think, and you seem to be nodding and saying yes, so I, I'm just trying to amplify it, uh, what you said. I, I agree entirely. Yeah. Okay, yes. good. Um, because that's, right. th that's what I'm trying to get out, right? That's what I'm trying to get out in that, th that, that, that one part, of, that one poll. I'm trying to get that out and bring that into um, a ne Neoplatonic way of life. Now I'll let you go to the next question. Oh, wait, no, no, no. I, there's yeah. one more thing I want to say about the first, about the ritual. Okay. And and this is where we're going to differ a little bit, I think. Yes. Um, but it's a really important point. Please. Uh, 
which is that for us in for Christians in the ritual and in all of the symbolism which we use uh, you're using the word imaginal for to express our participation and our and our yeah. the, the way that we conceive and interact with with the um with these symbols the word that we would use in christianity is faith yes um because we are not conceiving these as uh some sort of provisional mm. mental concepts that perhaps in theory could change um rather we are conceiving them as eternal truths uh fundamental truths about reality which we accept on faith um and obviously by faith I, i'm not referring to a blind faith and something no, no, I, I yeah, yeah. um which we accept on faith and by faith uh we both accept it in in some absolute sense in other words that there's some absolute core to to what we're believing or there's to put it differently there's some absolute basis a grounding to reality uh which has to be there otherwise you're just chasing your tail mm -hmm. continually mm -hmm. um and which um uh, really goes to what saint paul says about faith he says um um, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, uh, in the King James translation in, in Hebrews. So, regardless of who wrote Hebrews, that's irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's... Um, the, um, so, so when we say that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, um, what we're doing and you know some of the fathers of the church uh talk about this explicitly and uh actually clement of alexandria talks about it uh very explicitly um saint maximus does as well the uh, with with faith with christian faith it's not we understand it in the orthodox church not as mental assent to a series of propositions of course not yeah by by which if we assent we therefore gain salvation as you know maybe the most extreme protestant view would be right um and and i, I realize that many protestants would would not want to go that far with it, that simplification sure. but but anyways there's enough truth in it to make it a useful yeah. reference point sure. uh to contrast with uh, you know in in the orthodox church we're we're viewing in in these uh terms it's almost a definition that that saint paul is offering here um that that faith is making present actually present to us um both those things which we we believe to be in the in, in the future you know eternal life and so forth um but but also the the whole life of the church the whole uh, structure of the interaction of god with reality with with us with the human soul and the way that we correspondingly interact with with reality and with god that all of this is being made present actually present in such a way so that it i'll say i'll use this phrase um but i don't want it to be misinterpreted so that it becomes real mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and and but the thing is that the like you say the key difference here uh is that we are believing it as something real and something true and something absolute not not something provisional or mm -hmm. um you know something which in the back of, the, of our mind we know is well it's not actually that way um i'm just you know using it as a useful convention so uh, so 
I, I think from, from an orthodox point of view, at least, this is where this is one of the ways, it's not the, and the only way where, where faith comes in in a in a very practical way. And so where you are you describing um uh, all sorts of ritual and you're 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 describing all mm-hmm. sorts of um ways of having perspectival knowing which are genuinely useful for us to grow and to find meaning in our lives which i totally agree with um where you are using the word imaginal in many of those places not not all of them because i i recognize the place of the imaginal on its own terms Mm -hmm. um but in many of those places we would use the word faith and we would think of it in something in terms that are somewhat more amplified than than what you mean by the imaginal does that make sense it does and uh, i want to i want to respect that um so let me let me i gotta actually go in a couple minutes uh um uh, and so i i want to i want to invite you uh maybe very soon if we could pick up this thread and uh, because you still haven't had a chance to answer the main question Uh, (laughs) but uh, uh, we normally would have gone longer everyone but we had a bunch of technical difficulties as we were trying to do a previous uh, uh, filming and so we decided just to start all over but that cut out some of our time Um, but uh, I'm well it it, it goes without saying that uh, Bishop and I are going to talk again and hopefully soon and we'll we'll have a fourth and uh, we'll start with him answering maybe that the, the main question that he's still uh, preparing an answer. Uh, we're preparing a framework for within which to answer. Um, first of all, I, I want to acknowledge what you're you're saying. Um, I do think that there. I'm not going to claim its identity, but I, I'm 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 wondering how far away it is, because um, uh, I do think of this as real realization um, that we are we're we're not just sort of like I I don't think of the imaginal as projection. I think of the imaginal as a way in which we cultivate a receptivity that, that discloses real patterns and real re, real principles. And so it's an it's a matter of realization in both senses of the word that I, I like to use. And it's not a realization that's grasped, as you said, propositional ascent. It's re, it's a relation that is realized as religio, ratio religio, a proper connectedness, bindingness. Um, and, and I go further. I I, I think you know. Uh, many of these, I'll, I'll use your words for now, many of these enacted symbols are indispensable. I, I don't think they're replaceable. Um, I do I do wonder, uh, because of, um, you know, I, I, I see other symbols and other traditions also acting powerfully. Um, uh, I, I, I probably don't have your exclusivity, uh, but I do acknowledge indispensability, and I, I go even explicitly so in the theorizing you know, it's not just it's not just the, uh, Jennings emphasizes the what you might call the innovative aspect of ritual, uh, but Williams and Boyd uh, uh, emphasize uh, what you might call the conformity. They say rituals are are masterpieces uh, that you that uh, you're not trying to transform them; you're trying to be transformed by them. Um, and they were they they were um, doing some anthropology on a Zoroastrian ritual. And so you're faced with what's sometimes called the ritual paradox, um, which is um, rituals are treated as if they're unchanging masterpieces, and they should be. Please hear the second thing. But it's also clear that they have a history, and they have evolved and changed over time. Of course. Right. And trying to get a a proper framework that recognizes both of those is... um, uh, well, uh, in the Orthodox Church, obviously, within the history of the, the of Christianity, there have been diff- many different ri- yep, rituals. That's right. Um, w- what is important, of course, is the principle behind. Yes. Rituals, yes. That... Um, rather than the specific uh, manifestation of 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 a ritual, which um, which could be variable according to time and place. Although in the Orthodox Church, we are extremely cautious about any sort of change in rituals. Yeah, I think you should be. And, and I want to say that's functional. I think you want to have a proper tonos between sort of 
uh, and you'll allow me seriously playing with the ritual so that it, 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 it you did it to some degree. You went into Neoplatonism and you came back and you re-ritualized some of your rituals, right? And that's what I mean by this. This, this you, didn't, you didn't like change the principle or the form, but you changed the perspective and the framework within which you were undertaking them. And so there is that innovative aspect and, and that's important because we want to, the ritual should help us fit if I can put it that way. But we also want to recognize that the ritual ha has a kind of perfection to it. And that goes back to the, the Greek word again. It, it's like a masterpiece. You don't say, hey, you know what we'll do? Let's take Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and let's change it. Let's make do this and this and this. No, because we think, no, no. And, and you're trying to get that. And I think that tonos is actually functional for rituals um, in a really, really important way. Um, so I'm sorry, we do have to end. Um, uh, this, this is, was wonderful. And I, I mean, and half of this and wonderfully. So this is, this is a gratitude, not a complaint was you doing that, that really brave narrative, which I really appreciate. So thank you for doing that. So I want to, we are now poised. I think, I think we're in agreement that we're at least poised. Uh, we're, we're not in complete agreement about ritual and I, I get that, but I think there's, we, there's lots of good connecting points to go back to the main question about, that 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 apex in the, the in the Neoplatonic triangle, right? The, I, I know you you really want to get to that. Yeah, I really um, want to get to of that. Of course, because uh, you know, I mean, obviously, that's that's or at least it seems to be where your work is focused right now. Especially, that's right. You know, your new series of after after Socrates, and um, I have, I think I have something of of of, of an answer. Um, I think you have something of value to say, and I I want to hear it, and I want I want us to continue doing this. Um, I, I, I do need to jump. This has been, I really appreciate these discussions in, in all the meanings of the word appreciation. And um, let's, let's get out, let's set up an email chain very quickly and let's get in, let's get you on the books for something very soon. And so we can just jump into this and get the fourth one. And then we'll, we'll, we'll have uh, three and four to release. Uh, two is going to be released. Well, it'll probably have been released by the time this video is out, but I'm just excited about continuing this conversation. So I, I hope you'll come back. Now, well, uh, of course, of course, I'll, I'll come back if you'll have me. Of course. And, um, uh, you know, the, these conversations are so thrilling and so fulfilling. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity that uh, that you've given me to be able to speak with you uh, uh, about these ideas, which are so really so important and uh, so so relevant. No pun intended. To <laughs> um, you know, both both I think to ourselves personally, and you know, to, to what's people. going on in in the world. So so thank you so much for for the conversation, John. And uh, I'm really looking forward to continuing it. Great.